The Jones Act is a ban on transport between two U.S. ports unless it's on a U.S. built, U.S. manned, U.S. flagged, U.S. owned vessel. The Merchant Marine Act of 1920, or the Jones Act, was designed to make sure that America had a viable merchant marine and that it had the ability to repair and build ships, and that that was important for our Navy. The nation's always had some laws that have to do with what kind of ships can travel in U.S. waters. But the Jones Act that we're using now is mostly because of a 1920 law. We look at the Jones Act and realize that it adds to uh, our ability to defend ourselves and to project American power throughout the world. I don't think it is a major contributor to national security in any way anymore. Obviously, we allow foreign ships all the time to come to U.S. ports, and they are allowed to under the Jones Act. The Jones Act just requires they, they come make their delivery, say, at New Orleans or Tampa, but then they leave and they go somewhere else. And if they come back to a U.S. port, it's only after having visited a foreign port. Historically, one reason that it was adopted was because railroads didn't want any competition from shipping. And so if you look at the United States compared to other places, like for instance in Europe, a lot of transport between places in Europe happens through uh, coastwise trade, from vessels going from port to port. Here in the United States, that traffic basically has to go by railroad or by truck. After World War I, we learned some important lessons. We realized that we were not very well prepared for that conflict, even though it had been going on for years before we even got involved. And so there were some attempts to get us more prepared. Since that time, the main justification that people have used for the Jones Act has moved to trying to make sure that we still manufacture vessels in the United States because they say, well, if we ban all vessels that aren't U.S. made from traveling between U.S. ports, that's an incentive for the domestic shipbuilding industry to build ships to service that trade. Unfortunately, that hasn't been very successful. What we've seen is instead of growing, the domestic shipbuilding industry has been shrinking over time. If someone says it's unsuccessful because we don't have the largest shipbuilding industry in, in the world, I would say that's not the standard by which it should be judged. And I don't even necessarily want the government trying to make sure we have the biggest shipbuilding industry in the world. I think the Jones Act is interesting to people now, at least, because it's been the news a couple times. The critics of it, they make a couple different cr critiques, but the first one they usually lead with is that it increases the cost of shipping with the United States. They compare what it would cost to ship something at an equal distance. The result of the Jones Act is that it's much more expensive to transport between two U.S. ports than it is to ship goods from the United States to Europe and vice versa. What that means is that if you have U.S. energy products like oil and gas, which we are producing more and more of in the United States these days, if you want to ship it to consumers who need those, you're better off shipping it to Africa, Europe, Latin America. It's much more expensive if you want to ship it to U.S. consumers. Having rum in Hawaii cost a little bit more is probably not a bad price. For protecting America's military, I mean, I don't mean to be insensitive, but I just think I'm not willing to make America more at risk. I'm not willing to open up 200,000 miles of coastline in the United States, not on its border, but inside to the rest of the world. We should stop playing this game about, oh, these are all national security waivers. And instead, the president should have the ability to waive the Jones Act when it is clearly economically punitive without providing any benefit to the U.S. shipbuilding industry. All it was designed to do was make sure the military had a viable shipbuilding industry and a viable ship repair industry and trained mariners. So we had this merchant marine idea and then the sea left capability. That's what it existed for and that's what it does. And I would argue that's what makes it successful. The Jones Act forbids any shipment between U.S. ports of liquefied natural gas because there are no liquefied natural gas vessels that are made in the United States that comply with the Jones Act. This isn't benefiting the U.S. shipping industry because nobody's building liquefied natural gas vessels here anyway, and all it is doing is harming U.S. producers who can't ship their natural gas to U.S. markets when that's the most valuable one, and U.S. consumers who can't take liquefied natural gas from the United States and instead have to import it from unfriendly countries like Russia. The Chinese would be very, very happy to pay us 
for the privilege of making that run in, in perpetuity. A lot of our interior riverways are pretty shallow, right? So basically there's ocean going vessels and then there's interior waterway vessels. No one expects ships to start going all the way from China up to St. Paul, Minnesota. That's not, that's not what's going to happen, right? So I don't think anybody's suggesting that we remove some of these limits for some of these interior waterways. The reason why the Jones Act is important to us is really pretty basic. It comes down to the simple idea of peace through strength. We look at the Jones Act and realize that it adds to uh, our ability to defend ourselves and to project American power throughout the world. The idea is that, well, we have a U.S. merchant fleet, and so as a result, it could be repurposed during wartime. Nowadays, the U.S. Navy relies on very specialized ships that they can't just take your local vessels and turn them into naval vessels at the drop of a hat. So that's just not how the modern military works. America has over 100,000 miles of inland waterways. And if you look at both sides of every river, then that means 200,000 miles of points of possible entry. It's a lot to defend. The president can only waive the Jones Act if it threatens national security. So that means that in the aftermath of a hurricane, when we desperately need new vessels to come in here and transport uh, oil and gas and other commodities between a place that's been affected by the hurricane, the president will give a waiver at some time for a period of time. But when he does that, he has to say that it's necessary for national security. The problem with that is that there are lots of consumers on the U.S. East Coast, as well as in uh, Puerto Rico and Hawaii and other places that really need oil and gas. And we're producing a lot of that oil and gas here in Texas and elsewhere in the United States. But our U.S. consumers can't receive it because the Jones Act forbids people from shipping it to, the, uh, to those U.S. consumers. Sometimes this is just the creation of the media, and I don't exactly know why they would do that, but the reality is this is a very funny anecdote of how it's portrayed so that average Americans are sitting there thinking, uh, these people in Puerto Rico are suffering and it's because of the Jones Act. And it's just, no, it's because of two hurricanes. And the Jones Act, because of the relationship that the shippers have with the government, they knew this was coming and they were actually, before the hurricane ever hit, were getting together water and tents and other emergency supplies. Our ocean ports already have foreign vessels all the time. So the Jones Act is not preventing foreign vessels from entering these ports. There are regularly exceptions, and as the situation in Puerto Rico illustrated, it wasn't needed. The, their problem was a different problem. They could not get the goods from the port to the rest of the island. And that doesn't get fixed by changing the Jones Act. If you can only be reached by seagoing vessel, you are disproportionately harmed by the Jones Act. There are lots of regulations that have both big costs and big benefits. You can think about those air pollution regulations where it costs a lot of money to clean up our power plants or refineries, etc., but it also has big benefits for consumers. So one of the goals of my research is to find areas where there are regulations that cost consumers a lot of money, but don't have any kind of benefit. And the Jones Act is one of these. So for taxpayers, it's, it's, a, it's a great deal. So it allows Homeland Security to focus on our international ports. And they can put most of their law enforcement and preventative resources and their scanning resources in the places that international ships come into to load, load and unload. Now, there are some shipbuilding companies and some American sailors that benefit from portions of the Jones Act. It's an advantage if you are insulated from foreign competition. I think the priority for reform should be those parts of the Jones Act that currently benefit no one, that simply impose costs on producers of oil and gas and consumers of oil and gas without benefiting any American.